Hello everyone! In today's video, I'll show you how we set up an electric fence to keep small animals out of our garden. I say we because I couldn't have done this myself, and luckily I have a good-natured and very helpful husband. We made a bunch of mistakes since we had no idea what we were doing, and yet the fence works. It gives a nice shock if you touch it. My dear husband goes out every day to make sure it's working, and I go out every day to resuscitate him. Sometimes he uses the tester we bought, and sometimes he uses his finger, just for kicks. The shock will not kill you or any animals, but hubby says it's quite uncomfortable. I haven't tried touching it, and I don't plan to, as long as I have hubby around. One part of our garden is enclosed with a PVC structure we built two years ago to keep the deer out, and as we expanded the garden last year, we added T-posts with deer netting and chicken wire as well. This does keep out the deer, but not the smaller animals. We've tried using Irish Spring Soap and deer and rabbit repellent, and they work to some extent until it rains. And there's always one ambitious squirrel or rabbit that gets in regardless. And that, of course, is the hungriest and causes the most damage. So this year we decided to go all out with an electric fence. There's really no point to growing a garden if we can't protect it from scavengers. Well, maybe for exercise, but it's so disheartening to go out in the garden and find the animals have taken off with the goodies. Since this was a new experience for us, we read and watched every video we could before taking on this challenge. I say challenge because neither of us know much about electricity, except how to turn on a switch and maybe change a light bulb. So this was a challenge for us. One of the decisions we needed to make is which charger to buy, and we decided to go with this Zariba unit. It's battery powered and gives a nice shock if you touch it. Just ask Hubby. This is the battery powered unit we bought. I was debating between this and the solar powered unit you see here. These are both $99, but the battery powered one is rated as a more powerful unit. They sell AC plug-in units if you have an electric outlet nearby, and if you do, then I think it is a better way to go since it's a more reliable source of electricity. The solar power unit I considered briefly, but after reading the reviews, I decided against it. You can see here some of the reviews, so I decided to go for a more powerful unit and still keep the price under $100. And that's why we went with this Zariba 15 mile unit. Now, our garden area is nowhere near 2 miles, let alone 15 miles, but the area is not totally clear. There will be some grass touching the wires, even though we'll try to keep it as clear as possible. So a stronger unit will account for the brush under the wires. I didn't want to waste the time and money and end up with a weak fence, so we went for the 15 mile unit. The unit is advertised as low impedance, or is it low impedance? And I wasn't sure what that meant, so mother Google to the rescue. In non-technical terms, low impedance means the fence charger is designed to effectively shock through vegetation, such as grass, weeds, etc. Sounds right about what we needed, since we weren't sure how well we could control the grass growing around the fence. Since the charger unit we got relies on battery power, we bought two batteries, one to use and one to keep charged so we can swap it out when the other battery drains and recharge it. Okay, so here is where we made a major mistake since we really didn't understand how much power the fence would need. We got two batteries, both 12 volt, one rated at 7.2 amps per hour and the other rated at 5 amps per hour, and of course a battery charger. It's easy to recharge. Just attach these alligator clips, red to red and black to black, and plug it in until the red light turns green and then you're good to go. Because we had no idea how much power the charger would draw and how long these batteries would last, I bought two to swap them out. Well, after just three days, the 7.2 amp battery stopped working and I had to swap it out for the 5 amp battery while I recharged it. The 5 amp battery lasted two days. So it looks like I'm going to have to swap out these batteries every two to three days, which is not good. I probably should have bought this type of battery with 35 amps per hour and with the fence using about 2 amps per day that would give me around two weeks of battery time. But the 35 amp battery was significantly more expensive and I was trying not to spend too much on this project. 
so it looks like we'll have to buy the bigger battery after all. That was the only major mistake we made. The rest of this adventure went surprisingly well. We were not the neatest at wrapping the wires around or attaching them. It certainly wasn't a professional looking job, but it works, shockingly. Sorry, I couldn't help that. Alright, let's go back to what else we needed to build this fence. Well, we need a wire, and this is what I bought, two spools of 17 gauge wire. Each spool has 250 feet of wire, and we measured around the perimeter of our garden, figuring we were going to go around either three or four times, so we got two spools. And to hold the wires up and keep them above the ground and away from the existing fence, I had to get these insulated posts, which we threaded the wires through and all around the perimeter of the garden. At some points, we used an extender to get the wire even further away from our existing fence. These extenders are really made for T-posts, so they don't attach very well to the white insulated posts, but we did the best we could. The wire should wrap around the garden area without touching anything non-insulated as best as you can, otherwise it may short out the system or drain the battery more quickly. So we wrapped the wires round and round using the insulated posts to keep the wire from the garden enclosure. We put the lowest wire as close to the ground as possible without touching the ground and then spaced the other wires about four to six inches apart depending where the clips were on the white posts. Speaking of ground, you have to have a ground to complete the circuit or there won't be a shock or very little shock. So we bought a grounding kit. We have extremely rocky ground and we've never been able to pound anything in further than a foot and even that's iffy. So we bought the three foot grounding kit you see here and sure enough we only got about a foot into the ground. The grounding of this system is extremely important. As you can see in this picture from Zariba's website, when an animal touches the charged wires, the current travels through the animal, or husband, down to the ground to complete the circuit and get a shock. If the animal or human is not touching the ground or is wearing rubber soles that insulate the person from the ground, or if the being is a bird and so it's not touching the ground, then the circuit doesn't complete and there's no shock. To ensure a good shock, you need a good ground. Here's another diagram from Zariba showing how the ground should be set up. You can see three stakes spaced about 10 feet apart and 6 feet deep. They're wired to each other and then wired to the green terminal on the charging unit. Also, the ground should be wet or at least moist, not dry. If your ground is dry, make sure to water it. Here you can see how we set up the ground. Yes, we are amateurs at this or even below amateur level. We had a tough time getting the rods into the ground, but we did. And we wired them up. Not so neat as I've seen others do, but it doesn't have to be neat. The wire just has to have good contact with the metal rod, and that's what these clamps are for. The same is true for how the ground wire is connected to the charger. It just has to touch the terminal. You can see that we twisted the ground wire that came with the grounding kit around the green terminal in a U-shape around it, and then twisted the green cap over it to secure it down. Now for the red terminal. That's for the hot wire that runs to the fence. We wired the wires together like this, similar to what you see here in the diagram, just not as neatly, and then ran the wire from the fence to the red cap terminal, and same as the ground wire, wrapped it around, metal to metal, and then capped it off with the red cap. Once we were done, we were ready to connect the battery. This Zariba unit comes with two wires running out from the back, one black and one red, and it comes with these metal alligator clamps. They're pretty strong and take some serious hand power to open. The black and red wires from the Zariba unit screw into the clamps, and then the clamps attach to the battery, red to red, black to black, and we should have power. We didn't expect it to work after the messy job we did with the wiring, the ground not being in the ground, and after all, we had no idea what we were doing. We bought this tester also from Zariba to see if there was a charge going through the fence. In order for the tester to work, you need to put the probe into the ground and then touch this metal part to the fence or hook it on the fence. There are LED lights that flash to let you know the fence is charged, but it's really hard to see the LED lights in bright sunlight, so hubby's finger to the rescue. And unbelievably, it worked. I don't think anyone was more shocked that it worked than hubby. 
To make sure that no one else gets shocked, unless they're looking for some excitement in their lives, we bought these warning signs. Eight come in a packet, so we place two on each side. It might be the law in some places to put these signs around. Law or not, it's a good idea. Aside from the tester and hubby's finger, you can also hear a clicking noise if you listen. And that means that there's power and it should be working. The fence pulses out an electric charge at intervals so that animals that touch the fence get a shock and then can run away and hopefully never come back. The pulse allows the animal to let go of the wire and run. That's the idea, right? It shouldn't have any lasting harm to the animal physically. Psychologically, I don't know, but no physical harm. If the animal is smart enough, then it should learn not to go near the wires and to stay out of the garden. Oh, one more thing. You can buy these insulated gate handles if you want to create a way to get in and out of the wired area. We created a low fence for small animals, so we just unplug the battery each time and step over the fence. It's low enough to do that. Our nuisance animals, such as squirrels and rabbits, are close to the ground. But if you need to keep out larger animals and your fence is higher, then you should get these gate handles. Right now, the chicken wire fencing and the PVC enclosure works on keeping the deer and larger animals out. So, because our problem is the smaller animals that are low to the ground, we built a lower fence that we can step over easily. We can always add another wire higher up if we find we need to. In that case, we'll use these insulated handles to make an entryway to get in and out of the garden. So far, so good. It's early in the season and I have yet to get the plants in. The weather is still iffy and frost is still possible until May 15th. And I've made the mistake of planting too early in the past. So I'm waiting until the last frost date, but we're very excited that the fence is working and I'm hoping I can get some video of the animals when they get shocked. Hopefully it will teach them not to come back. Aside from the battery not being powerful enough, we discovered that the housing we made for the charger and the battery were not totally rainproof. The housing was a simple plastic tote with a tight fitting cover. I drilled two holes at the bottom to feed the ground wire and fence wire in and I drilled four holes behind to secure the charger to the T-post. They were small holes and I was hoping the rain wouldn't find its way in. The first couple of times it rained we were ecstatic. The inside of the bus was totally dry. But then we got one of those nor'easters that come around with wind and rain ripping about and the water somehow got inside. Not a lot, but enough for us to decide to cover up the entire box with a plastic bag. More protection. Ugly, but protected. Please realize that we are complete amateurs and have absolutely no training in electricity. So if any of this information is wrong, I'm sure I'll hear about it in the comments. Please be kind. We tried our best here and it seems to be working. So you can't argue with success. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and learning from our mistakes and thank you for watching. Bye!